Hello, sir. Welcome to Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes. Uh, today we have General Hummer, the infamous General Hummer, and it's just an honor, honor to have you here today, sir. Um, I've got a few questions for you, and uh, I know we've spoken a lot before, and uh, I've had the honor of, of having uh, dinner and lunch with you and your wife, who was also a Marine. She was a Marine, right? And uh, she probably, you probably had to marry a Marine. It probably, the, probably, you know, the, to make it all work, I, I'm sure uh, we need to have her on as well. But uh, first question is, where's your home? Oh, well, first off, thanks. Thanks for doing this. I think it's great. I think the uh, Honor Cafe Hall of Heroes, I think it's an important thing to get, get the stories of veterans out there. There's incredible stories. And you know, sit down and talk to any veteran, and you're going to get some stories. And of course, those, uh, the combat stories are very good, but there's also some good garrison and training stories that are out there. Um, I will start out by saying uh, I don't consider myself a hero. I consider myself uh, having served our country because our country is very special. Um, fighting and working under our, our flag uh, because our country is uh, the most special country that's ever, ever existed. Uh, but where I'm from, I was born in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, pretty much grew up. In, uh, in Pennsylvania, but then joined the Marines when I was 17. And now your home is in Texas? Yes. Why Texas? Well, um, that's a story unto itself. My wife is from uh, Wisconsin. I'm from Pennsylvania. So the first criteria for a retirement location was no snow. And then uh, no state taxes and a good conservative state, Texas barbecue, and it goes on from there. Amen. So when did you enter service? So, um, uh, I mean, that's a whole story. So my dad was a Marine during World War II. He got wounded in the Battle of Okinawa. His entire squad got killed except for him in a uh, Japanese knee mortar barrage at uh, Sugarloaf. And um, uh, at Shuri, Shuri Castle in Sugarloaf. Um, he got out, went to college on the GI Bill. Uh, so I kind of knew I always wanted to, to be a Marine. He was, he was a hero to me, and there's more to that story. Um, so I uh, wanted to join the Marines. I got out of high school. I was 17, had my mom sign for me, and uh, went into Marines for three years. Wow. Uh, so the Marine Corps, that was destiny. There was no, no other alternative. Uh, you know, the, we've talked before about the differences between the Marine Corps and the Army, and you, you always joke and tell me it's the big Army, you know, because you can, you can get things done in the Marine Corps that you can't get done in the Army. And, uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, and, and I kind of envy that as an Army guy. Um, but uh, when, when was your first deployment into a combat environment? Well, it was actually uh, uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. So I was a colonel. By that time, I'd been, uh, I'd gone out with uh, Marine amphibious units and Marine expeditionary units my entire career, and there were times where we planned for contingencies, where we thought we were going into hostile environments, uh, but never really made it into no kid in combat till till I was a colonel. So it was operational uh, Iraqi freedom. I was in First Marine Division then, uh, commanded by uh, General Jim Mattis and um, for the invasion of Iraq or the liberation of Iraq, as many say. Uh, and you served with him again when, um, uh, during the next invasion, or so to speak. Well, um, so actually we were in 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines together when he was a captain and I was a lieutenant. Wow. So that was a little while before. Uh, so we'd known each other since that, that time early in both of our careers. And just to set the record straight, what was his call sign? Well, his call sign when he had 1st Marine Division was chaos. Chaos. And you the, were? Who was your Well, I, I was, it was uh, as the commander for uh, Regimental Combat Team 7, it was Ripper. And that was the, the unit name. That wasn't my name. So in Desert Storm, 
uh, General Fulford or then Colonel Fulford, he was Ripper also. So that gets handed down. So Mattis would have been Ripper when he had 7th Marines. And then, of course, I was Ripper. That got, got handed down. So his call sign was, again? Well, his call sign was Chaos. Chaos. And I know the media says it was Mad Dog. I never heard that as uh, when I was in the Marines. So, I, you know, I think some of the Marines may have called him that and the media picked up on it. You know, so they yeah. ran they ran with Mad Dog. And then, <laughs> it's just interesting. Yeah. Um, when you went... Chaos into, is much more apropos. Yes, yes, I agree. <laughs> when you went into the combat environment, when you first got deployed in that environment, what's different than, than when you, you think it's going to be? Because you have these, you know, imaginations, how it's going to be and how it's going to work. And then when you get there and things start happening, what's... what's the biggest difference, you think? You know, it was interesting. Um, we trained really well. Uh, Seventh Marines was stationed at out at 29 Palms. Uh, desert, spent a lot of time in the desert. Armor mech operations. Live fire, armor mech operations were very common. Uh, we had exercises called uh, Steel Night, and we do combined arms exercises. So uh, we felt very, very much at home in and around tanks, Amtraks, artillery, uh, air bombardments, uh, things like that, live fire. Uh, so when it got into real combat, it was just a little surreal. And you had to nudge yourself every now and then and say, okay, I'm, I'm in real combat now. Um, but you, you were there in, in the desert, in a different desert with tanks and Amtraks. And it, it was uh, uh, felt very comfortable in what we had to do. And people knew, because I believe we were very well trained. Uh, we had trained hard in the desert, uh, and we knew how to do combined arms. And that's exactly what it took uh, once we got into Iraq and then headed up to uh, across the Euphrates into Baghdad. Um, after that, uh where did you go? I, I know we talked before about you going to the Pentagon is, is kind of your last position. And uh, was, was that your last position? No, my last, I was actually the deputy commander for uh, Africa Command. Oh, okay. What was that like? That was, I, I call that the uh, most operational tour I've ever had non-deployed. <laughs> so our headquarters is in... Uh, Stuttgart, Germany, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the European Command headquarters is there also. Different, different locations, different bases, but within about 30 minutes of driving distance because we had a close relationship. AFRICOM and uh, UCOM have close relationships. Um, so the reason I say it was the most operational tour was because a lot of things go on in Africa, the various countries in Africa. Uh, you may not hear about it in the news, but things are going on there. And uh, we, each one of the, the general officers had a suite of communications equipment in their basements. And uh, uh, secret cryptography, things like that. Things were locked up in safes. Uh, the door was locked. Uh, no, no transmissions could get out, but I had communications. I had a red switch that I could talk to the Pentagon. Uh, I had uh, uh, video teleconference capability. Again, I could talk to the Pentagon or any of our subordinate commanders. And uh, well, we have long days doing things with, with Africa. And of course, there was a time difference between us and DC. And uh, in the evenings, you know, I'd finish work maybe seven, eight o'clock in the evening, come home, get a bite to eat and then maybe watch a TV show with my, my wife. Uh, and then before going to bed, I tell my wife, I'm gonna go down and check comms in the basement. And she didn't know if I was gonna be down there two minutes or two hours. Wow. So she didn't bother staying up. So I could be end up being in communications with the Pentagon uh, or, or in communications with our general officers or the Joint Operations Center right there on our location in Stuttgart, but just tracking all the things that were going on. And we did have military uh, in Africa. There's quite a few military in, in Africa. 
and they do military to military operations. We work with other countries' militaries to help train them, and of course that's always good training for us. But then we also have uh, counter-terrorist operations going on in and around uh, the various countries in Africa. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people don't realize that's going on, how much of a presence we have there. Uh, you were at the Pentagon. What was your position at the Pentagon? So I, I uh, one of the positions I had was I was the uh, deputy to the uh, Marine Corps operations officer for uh, for the actual Marine Corps. So with that, I would attend various meetings. Uh, we had various concepts and things going on with the the Marine Corps, and uh, so I, I worked for him for a period of time. Interesting. Um, this is a big question, and and. You know, I, it's going to probably be difficult for you to answer, but because you served for, for how how long did you serve? You you went in what year was it? Well, I went in in 1970, and you were enlisted, right? And and then uh, then you you made the jump. You went back to school. Where did you go to school? A uh, little school in Pennsylvania, Albright College. Okay, and you came back commissioned, and then when you did you retire? What year? 2015. How many years is that? Well, that's 45 years, and then subtract college. And that it's 41 acts. So, and you retire as a three star general. And uh, what, when you think about the, the breadth of your military career, what, what stands out the most? Is there a story? Is there something that when you, when you think about your service, what, what stands out the most to you? There's a lot of stories. Um, I, I think what stands out, what I would say in answer to that question is. Um, I, I had and have a passion for Marines and for the Marine Corps. Uh, but then I'll expand that because not all my jobs were in the Marine Corps. Sometimes I was in the joint community. And that ex extends then to all service personnel that work so hard for our country and their services also. So, and the, the Army fits in there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, they, you know, I've always told service personnel pretty much wherever I went that they they never get paid enough for what they do, and they they always deserve bonuses and they always deserve medals uh, for what they for what they do. Uh, the American people can't pay them enough for their lives of service and contribution and we, we all essentially write a blank check to the american people when you sign on the dotted line and certainly the mothers of those signing on the dotted line know that uh, conceivably they not only might that check that check be cashed but the entire bank account might be forfeited and uh but they continue to serve and uh they serve gratefully they serve honorably, and it's just wonderful to be a part of that organization. And of course, we are and have been part of the greatest military in the history of the world ever. And the training that goes into these folks, the quality, the opportunity of their experiences, their character, uh, who they are, what they believe is just absolutely incredible. And that that's fulfilling and every day I would go home fulfilled in working with such people. Wow. That would be a great place to, to stop the interview uh, because I, I can't imagine anybody saying what you just said any better about the, the sacrifice of our military and what they do. But I do have one last question and it's for the enlisted people that are out there that, that have this thing in their mind that when you make general you got it made. But I was laughing about a story you told me on the invasion of Afghanistan, how you couldn't find a decent chair to sit on. <laughs> so what was that like? You know, your general officer, you're coming into, was Bagram you came into? Well, so I was still a colonel. Oh, you're still a colonel. Okay. Right, but I was working for Joint Special Operation Command, and we okay. were, this was 2000, fall of winter of 2003, and um, there, were, there were some initial folks there, but not a, not a big presence. And um, we, we had a joint operations center. And uh, I remember the, uh, so 2003 is early on. 
you know, in the in the conflicts, both Afghanistan and and Iraq, still. And I had a folding metal chair, and the front right leg was broken off. About an inch and a half was broken off. So when I sat in a chair, I. I sit forward and I, I just remember that the war started on on the metal folding chairs yeah and then of course later we graduated to more expensive REI yeah. chairs and you know things that contractors had put together but yeah, yeah. I always remember that that chair sitting in I was the chief of staff then so I wasn't in charge but I would be sitting at the, the right hand side of the commander and I remember my chair had an inch and a half missing from the right right front leg. That's great. And, and I and I know um, even when you were uh, stationed in Hawaii, when you were the commander of uh, Kaneohe, I mean, people think you had made there because I've been to that house. I've, I've you know I've not in the house, but I've been by the house, and and uh, and uh, I, I was always excited because as an officer, I was I was a lieutenant colonel at that point, and the, they recognized lieutenant colonel with the parking space, so I used to like to go to the officers' club. I like. Well, I'm actually, you know, yeah, I got a parking space. It, it wasn't in 06 at that point, but I, I remember, you know, you telling us stories about, you know, how hard you worked there and how everybody thought you had it made because you had the best house with the best view on the best real estate in Hawaii, which the Marines had the best real estate, and and how it was just endless work from, you know, ODAR 30, not being able to even see the ocean until home late, you know, with an event, and how everybody thinks you got it made, but I know how hard you work. You know, I actually do. So for those of, uh, out there that, you know, that think, you know, once you make general officer, you got it made, it just means more work. Well, yeah, the, uh, yeah, once, once I found out I was selected for general officer, you know, I kind of looked at my wife and said, okay, you know, stand by, stand by for the ride. Uh, because we pretty much lost control of our lives at that point because we were told where to go, what to do, how to do it. Um, just social functions alone, uh, we could probably attend a social function every night and two on Saturday and Sunday uh, if we didn't, if we weren't careful, and we'd just absolutely burn ourselves out. And that's not including the, the work a day. Okay, I've saved the hardest question for last. Um, how how is it at that level? Um, Riding home or, or dealing with you know the loss of, of, of troops, Marines. How 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 do you work through that? And um, and uh, I, I guess emotionally, spiritually, and you know when you're when you're at that level and you've got to either write the letter or um, you're dealing with the, the fact that you lost you lost men. How how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, that's not it's not easy. Every event is different uh, based on the individual, the casualty, how it happened. Um, so, of course, I'm I'm spiritual. I'm a Christian. Uh, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe there is an afterlife life uh, for those that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, a, uh, in eternity while there's an afterlife for everybody um, so you know I, I would try and live live my faith and uh, hope that uh, the people that I was working with had faith also and of course they say everybody in a fight and hold believes in God um, and and for the families uh, but it's it's very difficult I, I will say that I, I didn't lose that many. And I felt that was attributed to the training that, that we did back to 29 Palms and all the, all the things that cause we, we trained very hard. Um, and they, they said, the, you know, it said the more you sweat in peace, the less you believe in war. And that, that's, that's pretty true. Um, I have met the, the parents of those, uh, some of those that were killed under my command. Um, it's a long, long time now since 2003 and uh, 2004 and some of those, those casualties. 
uh, one of the families I keep in touch with exchange Christmas cards. Um, you wonder, you know, what they'd be doing now if they wouldn't have become, become casualties. Um, and those those are things that the families will carry for the rest of their their lives. And uh, you know, I know the individuals that uh, that I lost. Uh, you don't you don't dwell on it. I mean, initially you were concerned. You look at you know what kind of mistakes were made, but uh, a lot of them there weren't any mistakes. It was just com combat things that, things that happened. So you deal with it. Um, ask God for His compassion on the, the families that they continue to carry and mourn and grief, which is a, a normal process. God's given us that ability to uh, to grieve. Over things like that, but uh, obviously hope they're in a better place. I want to thank you again for being on the channel, for all you've done, the service to your country, and you're like a living icon here at the Honor Cafe. In fact, if you come in and you, you look around the walls, you see a, a lot of the things that you've contributed to this this museum, which is the Honor Cafe. So thank you again, sir. No, thank you, thank Appreciate you. I it. think it's real special. I think Honor Cafe is awesome. Uh, the food they have here is absolutely incredible, but the uh, the clientele and the environment, uh, just, I mean, you run into veterans that have incredible stories all the time. If you have the time, just sit down and ask them what their story is. I don't, I don't believe I've ever run into a veteran that was hesitant about telling their story. So I think, I think it's great and it's special that you're doing this. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you again for tuning in.